taget ud fra. Eccoci, eccoci. Welcome to the last meeting of the week. The show that normally is recorded on a Friday afternoon. But because we don't follow any rules today is Monday, national holiday. Um, but the spirit is still the same and we will still publish on Friday. We are a little bit rattled today because Filippo, good morning, how are you? Filippo Sebastio, the engine of this podcast at my left. My name is Fernando Mendez. And in front of me is the the first star of this podcast, actually literally, because you are the, the you have the star already. So finally we start getting some credibility and validation. <laughs> Antimo mm-hmm. Merone, welcome ciao, to the ciao. week. How Th- was your week? I thank mean, you, thank week. you for having me, first of all. Uh, yes, my name is Antimo Merone. Uh, I was last week. Uh, it was a usual week of work uh, with a very busy weekend. Uh, I was quite happy about uh, the weekend. We have very nice customer, also people visiting Hong Kong. So that's a little bit uh, give us the confidence that Hong Kong is uh, shifting back to uh, what it used to be uh, a little bit. There's small steps, still a long way to go to recover uh, that flow that we used to have. But uh, we are happy to see some, uh, some light, some light, some signal. Things are changing, I have to say. Um, I was in China last week. Beijing, not so much, because Beijing is always, you know, this type of a like, kind of post-Sovietic, uh, how to say, super grand, uh, grazie, grazie, Filippo, super, super grand city. Um, and w- there was Mr. Putin in the city, so, you know, ah, there, yeah? were, there were constant traffic cuts. Okay, yeah. It was a nightmare to go around. By then, I, I, um, I was in Shanghai for 24 hours. And for the first time in Jingan area, with all of the you know little bars and so on, it was finally full of people drinking in the streets, Fancadeli, full of people. Okay. Uh, so I got a good vibe, despite the fact that you know the situation is a little bit um, un- suboptimal to say the least. Yeah. But uh, no, no, I, I I really hope that uh, this vibe, which is you know it's taking a little bit longer than I expected, but it's the trend is always upwards. Um, coming back from the with the, through the airport, it was full of people as well. So hopefully that will translate to my business, your business, and yes. everyone will feel a little bit uh, better. We, need, we, we just need to keep the rents as they are right now, and <laughs> then just increase the business. Um, Antimo, uh, I, am, I have to confess something to you. One of my weaknesses is to express my admiration because sometimes I'm a little bit, uh, how to say, I, I fear that I, that I look like a groupie. <laughs> but uh, I'm very excited that you're here because in the last uh, two, three years, I think I haven't eaten in a better place than yours. And, uh, and, and, I, you. and I say this from the bottom of my heart. I mean, it's not like I go to, you know, Michelin star restaurants every week, but I've been to a few of them. Uh, I repeated one that I was in a few years back. I don't know if I should say the name. No, you don't say the name exactly. because they are my friends, and I don't like you exactly. to mention them. Exactly. <laughs> but exactly, I think maybe I think you know. I think you know. Because who you I mean. mentioned, yeah, you mentioned me before. So I mentioned you before. I remember uh, that. And, and uh, so I was at them, uh, and I and I love them. But uh, but then you know I said okay, you kind of compare, no? Uh, and then I was in another one that I, I don't know if they are your friends, but. Uh, they were, I think, best best restaurant in Asia. Uh, I say Le Doux. It's okay. Don't don't say the name. No, 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 no. He's no, also no. my friend. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but I loved it. I loved it. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, all of these all of these experiences are super good. But the 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 memory that I have from going to Estro was fantastic. I I I, I really you know I I really think that. I cannot explain to myself why I haven't gone back yet. So I will try to go back very soon. No, but I mean, it's, it's very nice what you say, because um, of course, it m- uh, makes me very happy to hear that uh, you enjoy the experience at our place, at my place, uh, because in, that's in the end my final goal, you know. Uh, I do this job, in the end it's a little bit selfish, but I kind of enjoy to make people happy. That's why I do this job, because uh, the long hours, the intensity, the pressure, uh, the financial, very, very small uh, bottom lines 
they are all justified by one goal, that by the fact that I love what I do and I love to make people happy. So uh, your experience, you know, is one of those that makes me keep going. Uh, but I also want to say another thing. Um, of course, there are good restaurants and bad restaurants, okay? So there are, you know, and uh, uh, among the good restaurants, of course, you have your preferences. Uh, and a preference, uh, the preferences of, of a diner are very, very, very individual, I would say, uh, because they also related, uh, and this one, not many people think about this, uh, but the experience that you have in my restaurant or in another restaurant, uh, apart from the fact that, okay, you like that kind of cuisine more than the other one, uh, the flavors are more familiar with you, or they impress you more than another place, which is very personal. Uh, the experience of a customer is dictated, or uh, I would say, plus made up by uh, several factors, including, and this is something very, very important, by your own uh, status, emotional status, about your situation in your life, in your work, in your love. Uh, so let's, I, I put a scenario for you that for you understand a bit more. If that night maybe uh, you had a big argument with Katerina before coming to my restaurant, maybe your experience was not that memorable as yes. you had it. 100%. Because your mood was affected by something external that would affect also your judgment in the experience you had at the restaurant. Maybe, you know, that night you were so peace that you didn't want to have a long menu and sit in two hours in my restaurant with people explaining you every dishes why you were arguing with your wife. Or maybe, you know, uh, another scenario, you, you had a very shit business, you know, it ended up very bad. You had a transaction that you didn't went through. You lost a lot of money yesterday on a, on a stock market or in the morning. And then you had this fixed dinner with your girlfriend or with your friends at my place. You come and everything sucks. So mm. this is something that I understand more and more. And it's also part of our work to understand what kind of customer we have and also the status they're coming in. If they're coming open and willing to accept the experience that we want to propose or if they want just to eat fast and go. So very nice what you say about my restaurant, but I also believe that night when you came to my place, you had a lovely moment with uh, your wife before coming. Uh, I, yes and no, I have to say. Uh, I think you're trying to get a little, little, a little bit of merit off of you. Um, <laughs> it was, it, there were actually difficult times. Uh, it was not a bad day, but yeah, there, were, yeah. there were difficult times. Um, so even though I think the going to your restaurant played a big role in making me feel good, yeah. uh, I, I think that you're right. I, think I, I, see, I see what you mean. Um, do you actively, let's say, uh, try to do something upon the entrance of the guests? So even if they had a rough day, they kind of like feel, feel at ease. Do you try to like, uh, how, how do you find out if they're closed or if, the, if, okay. if they're this open? Is a, uh, I, from, from my side, what I, what I do, uh, I can only observe. Because you know how my kitchen uh, and my restaurant is structured. Basically, I have an open kitchen and I stand at the pickup point where I see basically 95% of the tables. Uh, so when someone comes in in your restaurant, it's the first impression really matters. The way they approach our reception is asking for the, uh, the table that they have been reserved, uh, the way they sit down. Uh, so th the first few moments, it's my service team and uh, Andrea, which is my GM, uh, who's the one who needs, has to be good to understand which kind of customer you're having. Usually the first impression are the one that's matter. Uh, so you can see sometimes customer coming in with a, an attitude which is not very positive. Uh, so it's very good for, very important for us to take extra care to do some little gesture to make them feel comfortable, even if, even if they are not maybe in the best mood uh, they could be. Uh, because this is, if we manage to do that switch, it's a big advantage for us. Mm -hmm. Because meaning then we will have a service we could, we could offer our service and our food uh, at the best. But if we don't manage to understand what kind of customer you have in front, then it might be complicated because it might even uh, react, uh, I mean, provoke reaction from the customer that they are not so uh, pleasant for us. So uh, we had 
some customer that they were complaining they were we were disturbing the discussion why they they're having dinner because we were trying to explain the dishes mm-hmm. uh, but we are very willing to do so if you as a customer inform us that you don't want to be disturbed while you're having your conversation we will just place the place the, place the foods over there and leave but yes it's something that we need to be aware we need to understand so that i think very important in a restaurant like mine uh are not sops so standards uh, Operator, operations yes. yeah this is not something very important the more important thing is to tailor made the service to the kind of customer we have and that's the most difficult things because standardize everything okay we can do we train the staff we inform about every dish the ingredients the cooking methods where the ingredients come from uh how they need to serve from which side when they need to change a napkin when they need to refill water these are all things that you can teach but to understand what kind of customer you have in front and adapt your service to that kind of service that's i think the switch that can make you win a customer or not but if i'm not wrong my, intu- my intuition tells me that in order to to be able to to get out of the sops you need to have super talented stuff yes and how do you find that stuff because it's i mean i see that as in any business one of the key points and the most difficult ones is actually hiring people yes i agree i mean uh, there's a lack of talent in uh, pretty much all the industries because uh new generation they are not i mean especially my my industry new generation are not really willing to do efforts to grow uh, mm-hmm. in the industry they don't see our industry as uh, attractive as uh, other industries are uh, you know we are living in a world where maybe you do you work from home three out of five days you have to work uh, there are some nation you work uh, four days a week uh, our line of job is not work from home at all it's mm. working on holidays and uh, you know we, we we all work five days a week so we close sunday monday everyone has sunday monday off i want to have for me and my staff two days off in a row i don't want i want to try to avoid to have split uh, days yes. off in the week uh, because life is life and uh, has to be valued as it is uh, but we work five days a week long hours this for sure and we don't close on public holidays we don't close on christmas so uh, it's a work you need to be uh, on duty all the time uh, so going back to what i was saying uh, finding talent stuff is very difficult but if you t- manage to create a core of your team which is talented hmm. then the other will follow that so if you manage to have four or five people out of 10 that you have on the floor for instance that they're really passionate about what they do, that they really believe in what they do, that they really follow your steps of the leaders, uh, then you manage to pull the others behind you, uh, even if they don't have that passion, even if they're not so talented, even if they're not really, they're just executor, they will follow your lead and let you do this tricky work with the customer you have. But indeed, we have a shortage of stuff everywhere. and. Uh, Uh, our the industry is the same now it's a little bit better because uh, there was a period during covid that uh, all the restaurants were super busy it was literally impossible to find uh, stuff hmm. now it's a little bit better because situation with fmb is not that great and people are starting to stop what they were doing before of offering crazy salary crazy amount of salary crazy amount for overtime you know there's also a problem that in hong kong there's a lot of people who want to work just part-time because they don't want to commit Hmm. And it's not even about the fact of committing for working hours. It's about the commitment and the responsibility that comes with the commitment of working full time. Uh, because there's a lot of young people that they prefer to work only part time because they want less responsibility. They want to do the job, get the money, but they don't want to burden with the responsibility that the full job is, uh, is related to. Uh, I am very lucky in the kitchen. We we have a strong team that uh, actually follow me since a while. Uh, in the beginning, we have a bit of turnover, now not. For sure, next year someone will leave. This is uh, uh, part of the evolution of a of a team, so I'm not worried. Uh, on the front of the house, I also have few people that they are there since the opening, and that's my core team. You know, uh, the the um, I was going to ask you. I remember and Andrea is Andrea, is Andrea and his brother. No? Yeah, Marco. Yes, correct. Uh, I mean, I, I talked more with uh, with Marco because he was the one uh, serving the wines yeah. in, my, in my table, and he was fantastic. So let's say shout out to Marco because I uh, on Friday when I was having that pizza that almost killed me. Yeah, 
uh, I I drank a bottle of Didime, the Malvasia. Ah, Didime, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I I I found in Ramato. Okay. And as, I, as soon as I as I saw the bottle, I I thought about Marco directly. But you know the story of that wine. No. Yeah, the story of that wine is that uh, during our we didn't really do a honeymoon, me and my wife. But after our wedding in Italy, we went to Sicily, uh, where I cook in uh, in one of the resorts of uh, uh, the the winery. Okay. Um, uh, what's the name of the winery? Sorry. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly because uh, I, have a, I have a blank point. I will, I will go back to that later. But you know, this one is a, is a beautiful resort in Salina. It's mm-hmm. called Capo Faro, uh, and and I cooked there for a couple of time for a couple of days. And we say a week, and we had this amazing wine that come from this winery uh, at the sunset with my wife. So, okay, this is gonna be our wine. So when we are, when we are, when I opened my restaurant, I said, okay, let's order some Didi me because they were not important. Cat is actually the important, but they were not important. So they import this wine to, to put in our wine list because it's a very special wine. It's a very sweet and, fl- and, and flourished uh, nose, but it's very dry in your mouth. So it's it's very interesting because it's a dry Malvasia. Uh, so we, we bring this wine because of that, and then we put it on our list. So it's nice that you remember this wine. No, I love it. In fact, it's my, my wine, you know? If, if I, in fact, I'm crying because I don't have any more. Now, <laughs> now it's gone. So uh, maybe maybe you could hook me up. Because yeah, I, yeah, would I, buy, I, I buy a couple of cases can, tomorrow, can, but it's super, it's super. Yeah. Uh, no, no, super good. I, I, I think it's key what you say. And I will go into some of that stuff later. But before, if you allow me to rewind a little bit. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you, let's say, I, I know that you are from Napoli. Yeah. And then I know of the late part, they say the most recent part of your career, the eight and a half in, in Macau. Yes. Uh, and then Estro. I met you wh- when, when you're actually preparing everything in for the Estro. Transition, in the transition. Yeah, correct. Uh, what happened in between, let's say? Wh- uh, wh- in between you, when? <laughs> from, 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 from Napoli to Estro. What okay. happened in between? So uh, I left Napoli when I was 18 mm-hmm. uh, after my high school. Um, I went to Milan. Okay. That was my first step uh, out of my city. And I went to Milan to study uh, finance. Uh, I studied finance in uh, Bocconi in Milan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started my university, everything, first few years, okay. Then after a few years, uh, I kind of understood that was not my path. Uh, I was not happy with what I was doing. I was uh, simply not satisfied with... uh, uh, how my study were going and everything. So it was one day that I decided to just quit. Uh, I didn't miss much. I missed eight to 10 exam to the, my degree, uh, but uh, I didn't want to do it. So I was really kind of sick and stuck in a situation I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't move. So I left everything and I went to Berlin. And I went to Berlin in year 205. No, sorry, 207, mm-hmm. 207, 207. Um, so in year 207, I go to Berlin, uh, leave everything behind, and I say, okay, what shall I do now? Mm. I start to work in bars and places like this just to survive. You know, I have a group of friends over there, so I was just, I just need a cut and a new life. And something that I really like to do in my life was cooking. I always been a cook, home cook. You know, mm-hmm. I was the cook of the company in a university whenever there is a dinner or you know and i call mino because mino is my is the name how they know me back then and uh, let's call mino let's go to the supermarket let's buy a few things and we we do dinner so sunday lunch uh, dinners at home with friends there. i was always the cook uh, and i cook since i'm a teenager even in italy in napoli uh, i cook at home you know I, I always love it so i say oh maybe i should try to do something i like rather than look for a career that maybe can bring me money or whatever so Maybe just follow your your passion, right? So it's something a little bit stereotype, but it's then what I decided to do. So I started to work in restaurant in Berlin. I started from the very bottom, like uh, di- washing the dishes and everything, and then I managed to get into a restaurant that I really like, uh, a very tiny, small Sicilian restaurant from a uh, old school chef, mm-hmm. uh, not much uh, older than me, but uh, very experienced. I mean, I was there. I was 26 there and he was around 30, something like this. But of course he had 15 years of experience and I had none because I never worked in a kitchen before. That's my first proper kitchen job I had. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started to work in restaurant. I work. I, I become his head chef over there because he opened another place. And then uh, in year 2011, uh, my mom was actually kind of convincing me that uh, it's okay that I'm a chef. Uh, I want to do that. I like to do that, but I should specialize in what I do. Uh, so she kind of put uh, this like small uh, thing in my mind that I need to study uh, culinary. Uh, so we looked a little bit around. I didn't want to go back to Italy, uh, but in the end, was the best solution was to go back to Italy to study. And I went to Alma, which is a culinary school in uh, Parma, nearby Parma. Okay. It's uh, the Academy of uh, Guartiero Marchese. It used to be because now it's not involved anymore. Hmm. He also passed away with time and so on. But back then was a uh, the Culinary Academy of uh, Guartiero Marchesi. Uh, so I did Alma, six months of school, six months of stage in Barolo. Uh, and w- that was my first approach uh, to a Michelin star restaurant. Uh, I never worked before in a Michelin star restaurant. That was my first job in a, in a Michelin star restaurant. After that, uh, I had a small uh, work for so three, four months in uh, Villa Crespi. You know, the, uh, the restaurant got three stars this year. Uh, Antonino Cannavacciolo, you know the yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So he got the third star. Back ah, then, okay. was t- back then was two mission star. So I worked there uh, for a few months, and then I had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, my life changer, I would say, uh, because he's the one who, bring, who brought me to Hong Kong, uh, which is Philippe Leveillet. It's a chef, uh, two mission star in mm-hmm. uh, in Concesio near Brescia. Mm-hmm. Uh, back then, he needed to open a, a restaurant in uh, in Hong Kong. He needed a head chef. I was introduced my, by my previous chef. I did a tasting with like, so 2012, I arrived in Hong Kong. Uh, arrived in Hong Kong, uh, we opened L'Altro, which is uh, a restaurant that used to be in uh, uh, L Place, next to the mm-hmm. center on Queens Road. Uh, same year, we got one star, first star. So I was 30, just arrived in Hong Kong, five months from the opening, pow, we got one Michel star. So that was pretty something for me. Uh, it was, yes, 11 years ago, uh, it was uh, 2012. End of 2012. But so, let's say you, your rice is super meteoric if you think about it. Yes, I mean, yes, yes. It was very, very unusual for for, like for my for, for my for my line of work. Uh, I mean, you you kind of went to Bocconi, yeah. which I mean, you were not going to a mid to a mid level school. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. maybe that that level of let's say um, self uh, de- demanding from oneself a high a high level. Did you pass it to to the kitchen right away? You were not kidding. You just wanted to do something that you liked. Yes, but uh, I think the experience. I, I mean, I, I seriously do not regret my experience before the kitchen uh, because uh, it really formed me uh, as a man as well. You know, I mean, and also I utilize all the skills I got during my university time mm-hmm. uh, for the period that then I need to work on numbers as well because uh, let's say that. You know, to be a chef nowadays, you cannot be only a good cook. Hmm. Uh, first of all, you need organization in the kitchen that is like provided also from a formal and rational scheme, but you also need to work on numbers, uh, hmm. business forecast, um, <coughs> food costs, uh, inventory rotation. You know, they're all things that uh, if you have it, they are plus for you. And so this, m- this previous life I had, it actually helped me a lot to develop myself as a, as a chef. Uh, yes, uh, actually, you know, it's the, my career path was pretty much uh, going up very fast. I started to work in a kitchen when I was 25. Uh, at 30, I was head chef of one Michelin star restaurant, so it was something very, quite unusual, I would say. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you was that um, this dichotomy of, you know, punk, uh, self-made uh, cooks, chefs that start by washing the dishes, or a lot of people that go to culinary schools. But you combine both. Uh, you combine both correct, of them. Correct. Correct. Um, and then, uh, how does that influence your personality nowadays? Because let's say there is a there is a little bit of, of naughtiness of daring when it comes to your to, to your menu. Or I don't know if I'm maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into it, but that's what I perceived. But then you're very serious. Even the way you you let's say the way you have your hair, everything super clean cut, <laughs> everything fantastic. It, it's it's a very it's a very good midpoint. How do you see yourself? How do I see myself? I see myself as a first of all. I I, I think. I was kind of lucky, uh, but I always say that uh, uh, luck doesn't fall in t- on on your head. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like something that passing by through the clouds. You need to be good to uh, climb up the stairs and 
pull it down to yourself. So this is how I see luck. Uh, uh, you really need to try. And I was perseverant. I was very perseverant. When I was at school, I was old compared to my, my classmates, my schoolmates. I mean, uh, you, you can access Alma right after your high school. Hmm. So they were 19 years old kids and I was 28. Uh, when I was there, uh, I could feel I was good at what hmm. we're doing compared to their level, okay? And I wanted to push, I want more, you know, I was living in Parma, not in Colorno where the, uh, where the academy is because uh, a friend of mine uh, was kind of giving me a room in a flat, she was never there, so I say, okay, you can stay here for free. So for me, it was like, I didn't have money back then. So I was I asked also a loan to pay my, my school because that was my idea with my parents. I, we pay you in university, but this school you pay yourself. So we help you to get you a loan, but you need to pay the loan back. So, okay, okay, f fair enough. Maybe if they had paid you the, the, the culinary school, maybe you wouldn't arrive where you correct, arrived. I think correct, it's a good mindset. Correct, correct, correct. So that, that was the deal with my, my parents. And so they find me even like an accommodation for free, which was great because it was uh, extra money. So I didn't was not earning anything. Uh, so in the morning, I had to take a bus at uh, 6.45, something like this, from Parma to Colorno every morning to reach school. Uh, so school was like from 8 to... Uh, six something like this and then you need to study so I spent like six months like a crazy man study as I never did before but because I liked I liked what I was studying you know I was interested I was curious uh, and I also challenged my uh, my instructors over there you know sometimes uh, hmm. so I was the one who sometimes people I mean my my chefs over there I had to say hey shut up you don't know what you're saying you know but I, 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 wanted, I wanted a challenge and I was perseverant and I always remember that there was uh, one of the oldest chefs in the, in, in the school that one day he came to me and said, uh, you're good, you're very good at what you're doing, but you're old for this world. If you aim to go in a Michelin star restaurant and uh, high-end places, you are too old to start. You started too late. I'm sorry, you're good, but that's the truth. You are too late. Uh, he was, he, his, his intent was good. He, was, he didn't want, I think, to put me down. I think he just wanted to kind of stimulate even more. I, I yes. see it like this. Uh, facts are that I was the best student of that year. Mm -hmm. uh, I came out with the best votes on, on that year at, uh, from my colleagues. And I am pretty much sure, I will not swear, but I'm pretty much sure that I'm the first one getting out of that school to get a mission size head chef even though there were previous people coming out from the school before me. Yes. So what he was saying was not true. <laughs> Let's put it this way. So I, 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 I fought to, to get my way out, you mm. know. And even when I was working in this restaurant, you know, I was considered old because th there were people much younger than me who had my same position in the kitchen. So it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Was that a problem for you? Because I imagine that, you know, uh, a head chef sometimes he needs to impose a certain authority and if you have someone that is 15 years younger that it easier than if you have someone that maybe is big and looks kind of like correct, you. Correct, correct. It wa was that something that you faced as a difficulty? I, I faced this a little bit when I arrived in Hong Kong uh, because my team were all pretty much uh, older than me. I mean I arrived in Hong Kong that was I just turned 30 and most of the team that they uh, actually the company I was working for already put together they were all like over 30 you know my sous chef was 40 years old and this one for me was a little bit of a uh, of, of, an, of, of a barrier you know because they were not seeing me as serious as I should be hmm. uh, so fact is that uh, after two weeks we opened they all resigned <laughs> Uh, so how I, did you solve that? Yeah, it was that was very complicated because we are in the middle of the opening. They resigned not all at the same time, but slowly, one by one. But basically, in a, a month and a half, basically all the initial team left. Mm -hmm. So I had to rebuild the team from scratch. By this time, finding the person myself, and went much better. Uh, in fact, the same year, even we were very short in the kitchen with not much. Uh, manpower, we managed to get a star, so meaning that uh, I picked the right person for, for the job. Uh, so that was at the beginning. After that, you know, I also had to adapt myself to uh, local culture because mm. it was very difficult. 
uh, in the beginning, you know, I mean, you arrive from Europe, you're 30 years old, people pushing like hell over there, screaming in the kitchen. You arrive here, you do this, the moment you do, alone, <laughs> bye bye. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The culture is very different here. I and, and I have to say, it is better like this than I was trained for uh, over there. One of the things that I observed when I was in your restaurant is the, f the fact that you explained that your kitchen is open. And I thought, uh, because I have friends that work in the industry and in sp in back in Spain, and they tell me, you know, how, how, um, how to say, cuteness is not a, 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 a feature that people have in the way they talk to each other. Yeah. They just say the things. Yeah. But there was silence coming from, from your kitchen. Um, did it take you a long time to adapt or you found or you, you said I found my place a place where I can work and no one is yelling at me well it's the first time that uh, uh, I work in an open kitchen uh, I always had kitchen that were closed I mean Laltro was half open but there was just a window so it's the really first time that I have a, a open window to the dining room uh, but I have to say this kind of Man, I mean, help me to manage also my emotion during service. You know, sometimes I also get emotional, like uh, mm. uh, angry, or you know, something has to rush out. It's not proper, you know. So this one manage also. I mean, help me also to manage my also my anger. You know, you know, before uh, I was a bit more uh, loud in my yes. expression. So now with this format, I learn to express myself in a very, very, very. Uh, uh, easy way for my staff to accept and uh, that's good that's a good thing it's a good thing you don't need to scream to make a point and you and you don't feel like they, they respect you less because you no. don't yell anymore i actually i actually think my team respects me a lot for that because i managed to tell them what is right and what is wrong with of course different w in in a different way of course but without exaggerating on uh, being angry at them or uh, scream at them or whatever so this is something very positive that every kitchen should have you know nobody should scream at anybody in my restaurant scream to between staff or between me and staff is forbidden to scream nobody can scream at anyone if something is wrong we make a point if the person doesn't understand that's the door but yes. in exactly in the same way i'm telling you i will tell to one of my staff something like this i will never say hey get the fuck out of here doesn't work like this this is how it is you like it Yes, you don't like it? No. Okay, if you don't like it, this is how it is, because I'm sorry, but I'm the boss. Yes. So if you really don't like it, I'm sorry. That's the door. Nobody's forced to be here. So, so no, no, it's, uh, it's interesting. So, okay, so you, uh, you need to manage your emotions. You need to be perse perseverant, and you need to be able to, uh, to, put, away, to put away fires. Yeah. What, uh, what are other things that you think that now that and you know you've been you've been probably surrounding yourself with super high professionals for for now a bunch of years what are the, the characteristics that all of them have what, what is that that it factor that every successful chef they say okay you have it you have it, it there is a common trait what would you describe well for what i see within my industry uh <laughs> to be successful you need a bit of luck yes that's what we say but luck you need to pull it down from the sky it's not falling from the sky uh, consistency, perseverance, you need talent as well. I mean, there's very few chefs that have no talent that succeed in this job, in my opinion. Uh, talent for this kind of, I'm talking about high hands restaurant, you know, this kind of restaurant, because there's mm. chefs that are very successful, but the world of chefs is very, uh, it's, it's really wide. I mean, you can be a super successful chef as executive chef of one hotel, which has a completely different job from what we do. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do that job, for instance, with the skills set I have right now. Mm. I could learn, but right now, if you tell me, hey, can you manage a hotel with uh, 450 rooms, with a banquet room, with the events, with weddings, with breakfast, with afternoon tea? I would say no, because I don't have the skill set right now. Uh, so if we talk about high hand chef with high hands restaurant and fine dining, uh, what I can see, yes, you need consistency, perseverance, talent. Uh, you need also a mind for business and organization. Hmm. Uh, and you need what... Uh, there is a word in my dialect that really uh, express uh, this concept. Maybe you know about that. It's katsima, you know. 
Katsima is in English, it's uh, very difficult to translate, but it's basically that being smart and being adventurous and being uh, a little bit naughty at the same time put together in one adjective. Uh, so you need this kind of skills because yes. in order mm -hmm. to succeed, you need to really do sometimes things that you need a certain way of clicking yes. that other people cannot. Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a word in Spanish too, but I don't know if it <laughs> will be translated. <laughs> it will be espabilado. Uh, we're going to check it later because Katsima, I Katsima, like it. Katsima is bellissima. Katsima, I like it. Katsima express a word. Uh, yes. There's a word in Katsima and can have also different angles, you know, uh, from, depends on the context you put this word in, can have also different uh, meaning, you know. Hmm. Sì, 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 che è una cosa bad thing. If you can are also be a bad thing. Yeah, troppo yeah, 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 correct, correct. Sì, 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 è spavilato. Someone è spavilato is that someone that if you leave it by himself, he's going to survive. Uh, even, you know, for instance, let's say, uh, you can put in a, in, a, in, a, in a football, in a soccer context, right? Yes. So there is a player who has Katsima. Yes. And the player is very smart to do his job, you know, like uh, he give you that small uh, kick, but the referee doesn't see it. Uh, so it's just enough to take out your balance and to get the ball out of you. That's, uh, you know, the, it's no, very no, no, interesting. It's, I think it's exactly the same. Also because we are, uh, let's say, not so distant cousins, Napolitans yeah. and Spanish. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Day, absolutely. Someone, someone did the translation, changed the word, but I think the concept is the same. Um, I asked you, I ask you about the key, the, the key, the keys of success. What about the struggles? Because you, you mentioned um, you're doing something that requires a lot of passion. Because there is a lot of struggle during, and I imagine even even today, yes. there are sacrifices that you make. Yeah. What are those sacrifices that you say? These are the things that, if I could raise them, I I would live better without them. Well, uh, if. Restaurants are also business. So first of all, the financial uh, challenge you have uh, before to get the funds that are sufficient to finance your project. So this is the first challenge you need. Uh, other financial challenges are during operation because you need to pay your rent, which is super high in Hong Kong. You need to pay your money, which is super high. Uh, and cost of ingredients as well for a restaurant like mine is extremely high. So. You have three voices on your PNL, which are super, super high: rent, cost of uh, cost of work, so manning, mm -hmm. and food cost. These are the three key voices. Uh, and you cannot bring in that easily. If and you can bring it down easily, correct? If you want a certain service, you need a uh, certain amounts of chefs and service. You need uh, you want a, a certain location, you need a certain amounts of rent. If you want certain quality of food, you need to pay those prices for. So these are things that you can modify really, really, really little. What's, so finance a challenge, first of all. Uh, I think another big challenge in Hong Kong uh, for us as a Western chef, uh, which do this kind of uh, uh, food, which is a little bit more modern creative as a European, uh, is to let the market understand what you do. Uh, to break the stereotypes of the cuisine that we represent in a market that is like full of stereotypes and it comes from 30 years of stereotypes. Uh, this is also a challenge that I, I face right now in, in my restaurants, for instance, because you know, uh, you face yourself uh, as Hong Konger who also traveled the world and he knows what Italian food is and they come to your restaurant and say, ah, but this is not very Italian. Uh, my question, my, my answer to that is like, how you define, which is something very Italian and whatever. Ah, you know, but Italian is rustic, Italian is, uh, uh, is family style, Italian is big portion, Italian is uh, stereotypes, simple stereotypes. So breaking these stereotypes, it's a challenge that I'm facing since I open and I'm facing it right now because I still doing that. Uh, but on the other hand, I knew it before. It's not something that it took me uh, unprepared. I knew that when I opened something like this, with this kind of approach, which represents 100% what Italy is right now, mm -hmm. or a part of it, of course, uh, I, will have, I will have this kind of challenge. Uh, because in Hong Kong, for instance, high-hands restaurants, 
uh, the French one or the Japanese one. Uh, but there are not many Italian fine places. And even the fine places that they have a lot of awards and so on, they give this they give you this kind of comfort in the food that what a lot of Hong Kong people are looking for when they go for Italians. Mm-hmm. And there are things that and this kind of comfort yes and this kind of uh, feeling of uh, home food you don't find in my food so for them it's something that is missing so this is something that i face and i'm facing right now in my restaurant you know to propose a, a kind of restaurant which is modern is contemporary which has a different approach uh, which has a southern italian approach because my, my approach is totally southern italian and to let people understand that this is also italy uh, actually this is maybe more italy than a lot of things you think is italy it's a little bit complicated you know yes i i remember one of the the dish that made me smile um from from the menu this was it was not not long after you opened so i think it was like november 21 or I think it's no- November 21, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the dish that made it smell was the, the minestrone shot. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, for me, was fantastic because it was really taste of minestrone, and I, I have a special relationship with minestrone. Uh, a, because um, it's a dish that makes you feel very good, feel very warm. But one time I was in Australia in, um, I think it was July or August, so it's terrible to be in Sydney with the, the rain that comes, you know, at an angle, you're wet, and, and there is this, um, this restaurant in uh, I think it's Clarence Street in the CBD called Machiavelli, and it's b- it's been owned by by a, by a lady now an old lady for 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 years, and I always go there to eat the fusilli with seafood, and uh, you know mozzarella because it's super fresh, but this time it was cold, and I see and and the lady herself comes to me and you know every now they already know you because I always go to the yeah. same restaurant and she said I think you need you need to eat minestrone I'm like. Uh, if you say so, if you say so, I eat one. I ate the soup and it was like, wow. so after that, and, and normally I'm very, I'm very shy when it comes to chefs. Uh, and I, I, for, for example, when I went to a restaurant, I never, I even never went to, to take a picture or anything with you because I'm like, okay, let them work. But I couldn't help it. I went to the kitchen. I was like, signora, lei mi devi dire come, come questa ricetta. You need to tell me how you make yeah. this. And she, t- she told me how to do it. So it became a staple in my food. So I go to your restaurant. I see this thing. I drink it. It was like, fantastic. Poor, pure flavor. But at, at the same time, I thought, how many people in this restaurant understand yes. this shot? Yes. Because that's like... That's how many people understand the complexity of a small shot of... Uh, uh, warm liquid the taste of vegetable but they don't have first of all okay let's put it this way first of all there is a question of uh, uh, relation to the dish that it come from right so if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have a history if you don't have a, a benchmark which is a proper benchmark and not a fake benchmark to you you to refer it to then it's difficult uh, second you know, a lot of people think complexity, uh, I don't know, it's this part of the world or everywhere, but I think there's a misunderstanding of what is complex in the food or not. You know, food is not complex when they have 20 items on a plate with 20 different... Food is complex when there's complexity in the flavors, in my opinion. Hmm. And this complexity in the flavor can come for very complex process but then ends it up in a result which is very simple which is just a shot of soup that you drink like this Mm -hmm. Uh, so this one is something that i'm also trying to communicate with my food and it's good that you highlight this point because it's also something that i'm trying to do even more even pushing this concept to another level right now with with the menu i'm serving you know so you didn't take a lot of compromises uh, on the menu. Let's say you have a, an idea and you're trying to achieve this one. because No, but, you know, I, it's not about compromise. It's about adapting to what the customer likes here. So this one I do because uh, in the end I run a business. So it makes no sense for me to serve something that they eight don't people out of ten they don't appreciate. You know, yes. why, why I should do that? You know, I'm not, I don't, because then in the end... You know, we go back to what we said in the beginning. What is my final goal? To make people happy. If yes. I make people unhappy with my food that I think is beautiful, it's fantastic, what am I cooking for? For myself? No, I'm not cooking for myself. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing that. 
Because if I cook for myself, I cook at home with my wife. If I cook in a restaurant, I cook for my guests, and I want the guests to be happy. So if we, sometimes it happened that I did a dish that for me is fantastic, I serve it, the feedback is half and half, out of the menu. Out of the menu. Out of the menu. Not totally. I don't even try, I don't, e- you know, I don't bastardize that dish to make people like it. You I remove it. You remove it. I just remove it. This one I don't do. This one, the co- that's why I say I don't compromise. Com- compromise would be same. Ah, you know, make the pasta a little bit softer. Ah, you know, put a little bit this on because they like, or add this on top because they like, and you made a dish that is like uh, for Hong Kong people, for, for the Asian market. Yes. No, this one I don't do. If the dish doesn't work, as I thought it, bye bye, next dish. So mm. we, 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 we put an addition on the menu that is maybe more palatable for the, for, for the local market. No, no, fantastic. I, it, it makes sense. Uh, no, no, I, I like very much the reply. Also because I was discussing this with, uh, with a friend that uh, he, he does a lot of um, graphic design for restaurants. He's done eight restaurants now in Bangkok. Now Bangkok is, bo- is booming, yes. works a lot with uh, Willy. Uh, f- from, do you remember Willy from Fofo? Sure, yeah. sure. Um, and he was men- he was talking about how the, the new paradigm of F&B changed. You know, before people were going to the restaurant to eat at certain type of food and now people go to it food made from a chef with name and last name uh but at the same time it's actually very refreshing that you come to that, that you say no i it's me anti momerone but i'm doing this so to make you happy so uh, i'm trying to let's say um i'm trying to show you something but find a midway that yeah uh, how to say in which i can make you happy with my creativity if i understand correct. correctly correct when you're dealing with this um very demanding clients in hong kong because especially people that can go to your restaurant they can access pretty much everything how is that different from dealing with clients in italy well i think the biggest challenge is i say to let them understand that what i'm doing is proper italian uh, it's not a i mean to, to, to let people that have eaten the same thing for 20 years and think it's Italian and then all of a sudden they come to my place and they eat something and say it's completely different and say look this is Italian no but I eat this all the time and uh, it was not like this it was like that so to, to tell them I'm sorry but maybe for 20 years you didn't eat what this really is but you know this is the kind of flavors we we have in in, hmm. in our hometown you know that's the, the first challenge because uh, there's no, as I say, there's no history, there's no benchmark they can relate to. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, Asian, uh, in general, Asian customers uh, towards uh, Western food, uh, they have kind of, uh, um, I mean, they, they consider, for instance, Italian food uh, not as refined and not suitable for fine dining like the French food or the Japanese food. Because you see in Hong Kong, for instance, people pay like $4,000 for sushi mm. and there's no problem, it's no issue. They understand it's expensive. Uh, but if they come to my place, it's eight courses, like $2,000, oh, it's expensive for Italian. What it means for Italian? I mean, what it means for Italian, you know? I mean, the price of my menu is uh, a consequence of the skills the products and the work we do, not about the fact that I'm Italian or not. So this is something that uh, is a little bit challenging here, you know, to let people understand, yes, I'm expensive, I'm Italian, uh, but because there's technique, there's food, which is prime food, and there's a lot of work from an entire team and a big team to serve you to, so this is maybe something that uh, you will not have this in, in Italy because you know, if you go to a fine place in Italy, you pay those money, uh, and it's normal, it's natural. Yes. So, uh, Are there other nationalities, let's say other types of food s- suffering the same, that are not French or Japanese that suffer the same, for example, Spanish or some South American, Mexican, Peruvian? Well, I mean, if you, you, you know you're Spanish, there's no Spanish fine dining in Hong Kong. Uh, no. There's no Spanish fine dining in Hong Kong. Well, F- few uh, people tried, I yes. mean. Uh, Ando, no, I cannot be compared. Ando is Spanish, Japanese. Yes. That he, Ando has the <laughs> Japanese part, <laughs> they make it worth the money, you know? <laughs> but you know, for instance, uh, you know, there was one Agora, it just closed. Yeah. Ah, I didn't know it closed. Yeah, it's just closed. Uh, it was a problem with location, I think, because the food of Antonio is great, 
uh, I think the the location it was was very challenging for a uh, fine dining. Hmm. But rather than this, many people tried. And even Paco Rosero, when I arrived in 2012, there was Paco Rosero in Hong Kong. It didn't work. Ah, really? Yes, it didn't work. I didn't know he was here. Because I think there is a conception of the Asian, uh, I mean, Hong Kong market that certain cuisine are worth the money, but yes. others has to be casual, has to be rustic. And we as Italian, we suffer a little bit about this. Yeah, on the other side, the Spanish, uh, especially, you know, through the hands of uh, um, Edgar, for example, they have found a very good place on, let's yes. say, on the premium, which is on luxury, yes, correct. premium level, you know, the type of bar that is, correct. you know, actually, uh, I think it was, an, uh, there is some type, I cannot say it on, on but record, you know, I, I, I can tell you off record a little bit yeah. of gossip. But you know, you know, when I arrived in 2012, yes. it was the year of the Spanish, hmm. it was in 2013, they opened like hundreds of uh, Spanish restaurants. And in two years, they all closed down because it was kind of a trend now to the, the Spanish restaurants. And only the strong ones survived. Uh, there's just a few, few chefs in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, left from that era of the Spanish big movement. Edgar is one of those. Edgar used to have a small place called BCN uh, on Peel Street, or super hmm. su on Aberdeen Street, yeah. Super, super nice, super tiny. You know, it was doing like modern tapas. It was super, super nice. Uh, but you know, he's one of the few who, who, sti who still out on that. Alex, Alex uh, Vargas. Alex Vargas, that, yes, uh, of that, course. Let's say went, went back to La Paloma. Yes. Uh, he's operationally, he's very good as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's, he's, his voice is very good, it's very nice. But they're not high hands place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had, I mean, they try with Fofo, but yeah. uh, they had to close them as well. Um, now, going back to, uh, to Estro a little bit, uh, Estro, you know, now s Michelin star, any, everything is uh, on rails or it appears to be on rails. How is the relationship of, uh, of a restaurant and the star? How, how is, is it something that you fear, you enjoy, it's pressure, it's, it's, it's um, I don't know, it's confidence? Uh, okay, so. Let's put it this way. Stars are uh, awards given by uh, an independent guide who evaluate the job of a certain restaurant, gives some scores, and gives uh, a recommendation, a star, two star, three star. Uh, it's totally independent. And there is no formula. Hmm. There is no manual to get it, okay? There is nobody who telling you, okay, in order to get star, you have to do this, 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 and this. Check spot, okay, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. This is not how it works. So we don't know when they come, we don't know how they come, and we don't know also why they give us a star or they not give us a star, because there's nobody explaining you. There's hmm. nobody telling you, oh, you did a good job this year, so we get, oh, this year we had a problem with the third visit, we didn't like this dish, uh, you should correct this. We don't. We absolutely don't know. So it's something that I'm living with since now 10 years because uh, uh, first time I got when I was 30, now I'm 41. Uh, I got a start as well in Macau when we opened Macau. So mm. uh, I'm living this situation since a while. And it is a little bit pressure. But on the other hand, you if you see it as for what it really is, uh, then your pressure goes down because the inspector are customers. The guide is made for customers. The guide is not made for me to say, oh, I'm a Michelin star restaurant. The guide is made for you. Mm -hmm. That when you open the guide, say, oh, this restaurant has an award, it's one star, so it's worth to go. So if you think it as it should be and how we think it should be, then we should not fear it because we treat all our customers at the same way. And this is was primary, our first first discussion when I did with Andrea and the, when he opened the restaurant, say there must be no VIP in our restaurant. Because if you start to think this guest is more important than that one, it's worth more, then we will lose the essence of who it is. A good restaurant is not a restaurant, it's good that you go because you know the chef or you know the manager, so they treat you well and they give you better food. Yes. A good restaurant is a restaurant that you don't know anyone you sit there and you treat it exactly as you, the table next to you and you're given exactly the same food as the table next to you. So this for us was a, a primary goal and we do this every day. Of course, you are my friend. If you come, why you treat it better? 
maybe I give you an extra dish hmm. that I don't give to another people because I want to give p- things for free to people I don't know, but you are my friend, so I give you a dish for free. I give you a glass of champagne when you arrive, and I don't give to everyone for mm-hmm. the same reasons before. But that's your special treatment. I don't give you a different beef or a different oyster or a different dish because you're my friend. You're going to eat exactly the same thing of the unknown guest that book table two by himself and uh, is paying for his dinner. So this is, if you see mission that rewards restaurant for this, then you should not fear it. Because, yes. uh, and so this is something that I acknowledge and now I'm more confident with the age, you know? So uh, on the other hand, again, Mission is not done for chefs or restaurant. It's done for guests. Hmm. So it's a uh, it's a guide that suggests restaurant to 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 customers. You know. Uh, then of course for us in our world is super important. So I wouldn't say that I don't care because it's not true. I care a lot, uh, and we will try also to eventually get a second one. You know, uh, in the future. Uh, but again, how to get a second one? You don't know. You need to be better. But how better? You need to do better. How better? Why, why yes. are the things we need to do better? So, oh, better ingredients, better... Okay, so let's work. Let's try to... That's why my restaurant is a... I always say that my restaurant is not a static restaurant, it's a dynamic restaurant. Mm-hmm. I change the food whenever I want. If there is a dish I like, or product, I put on the menu. My menu is on QR code for two reasons. One, because I don't want to print paper, uh, over paper, over paper. Second, because I can change my menu any time I want. So if this afternoon I buy something I like or I, something I arrive as a sample in my kitchen because I want to try and I like it, tonight Closing. I sell it. Tonight I sell it. Maybe just for 20 people, fine. Tomorrow I change again, back again. Because I want, I want this kind of dynamism that allows me to do better all the time. I don't want to plan you know in six months i'm gonna do this no no whatever i have that i think is worth to be on the menu goes on the menu straight away this is my way to improve uh, uh my my restaurant as a experience for the guests as dishes for the guests uh, this is the way i want my restaurant to be a dynamic restaurant no no i i i think it's interesting i ask you because i am i am very curious about the mental part of of a job uh, because sometimes uh, you just see the description of, of what people do, but then you need to... I, I, I like to think about the contradictions uh, of, of certain circumstances. For example, when it comes to Michelin star, you know, being able to, uh, A, know that you need to have a, cer- a certain level of, of um, how do I say, of exigence from yourself, but you need to relax because otherwise it will eat Correct. you. Correct. Otherwise and it will hit you, you know. I mean, you, you're going to eat up yourself with the willing of doing more and having more and get more stars, you know, this is what's going to eat you up. Another, another contradiction that I see is, is, the, is that on one side, you mentioned at the beginning, that it's super important to be consistent. But then on the other side, you need to, co- you need to const- constantly be creative. Creative, correct. So, and these are like kind of like two different states. Like consistency is method and then yes, creative is like yes. break out of it. Like yes. how do you switch mode A or mode B, depending on, on the okay. moment? Okay, uh, very interesting question because uh, creativity is one part we didn't really talk about it and uh, it, it is very important for my line of work. Uh, uh, how do you switch from consistency to creativity? Okay, so the creative part, the, all the R&D things you do are things you don't serve. Mm-hmm. You serve only a dish, or I serve only a dish, when I think it's ready. I never serve a dish which is like, oh, half and half, or maybe we try, we see how's the feedback. I serve a dish only when I think it's 100% ready. And behind, there are trials, there are fails. So the creative process come at the back end. The consistency come the moment I'm serving you that dish. And I need to design that dish with my creativity in a way that is also consistent for the customer to have meaning it's not only me who needs to execute it's my team who needs to execute so creative process i mean you have ideas you have the creative process you have the trials with all the technical skill that involved in the dish and then you have the standardization of it so once the creative process is done and the technical issues are solved 
Then you standardize a dish that goes on the menu and it's consistent because you train your staff enough and you design that dish that uh, with the proper standardization that your staff can follow through. So it's not something that clash together. Hmm. I mean, it's not something that, oh, okay, I do this, or oh, tonight I maybe I put this for one night because I just tried an hour ago. No, if I have a product which is great and I already teach myself how to make the sauce, how to make the garnish and whatever, then tonight I sell this product like this. But, you know, consistency can come in acts after your creative process has been put in act in a way that your staff, your team can follow up through in a consistent way. So you need to have a method for the creativity. Yes, 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 for sure. I, I mean, mean, I, I, I mean you, can, you, you can be free hands, you know. I mean, you can create a thousand dishes. What you cannot do, I think, in the line of work I do, and there's people that are doing it. Eh? It's not, not something wrong. There are people that are really like, spontaneous cooking the dishes and putting them on the menu like this, which are brave. I don't do this. I mean, all my creative process come uh, at the back end. Yes. So once my creative process, it, I mean, it happens a lot that I had in my head brilliant ideas that they, they comes out as a shit. And I always have kind of a rule that I try something two, three, maybe four times max. After the fourth trial, I give up. I don't okay. I don't do more because maybe it doesn't work. Really it's taking too much of my energy, too much of my time, so I need to move on on something else. Because sometimes I think, oh, this one with this plus this, it works perfectly. So in my mind, it's fantastic. And for one reason or another, maybe, you know, uh, a cooking method which is not appropriate or, you know, uh, mixing of flavor that in my head works, but then on the palate doesn't work. I try to modify one, two, three, four times max, then I move on to the next thing because otherwise it takes too much of my energy, too much of my my thinking, and too much of my time. You actually replied to a question I had already. Like how 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 <laughs> how deep you go on iterations on the okay. same dish? Do you go back to a dish that you tried before and try it again? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes yes. Sometimes it happened that I take something that I did before and I elaborate more. But usually it's not the di usually are dishes that I already put on my menu before and I want to elaborate more. Not dishes that I didn't put on the menu because it didn't work. So okay. if that didn't work, it goes kind of in the, in the forgotten drawer, you know? And uh, it's hardly that I take it back. I but understand. some dishes that I put on my menu maybe a year ago, or even now I was in Macau, maybe I take that dish as inspiration of, I get inspired from my old dish to make a new dish with uh, maybe the same elements, the same flavor combination, utilizing another protein, so a different technique to highlight mm. it. Antimo, if, if, I, if I can take one, one step to the side, uh, especially because... Um, you know, doing interior design. Uh, um, I I was um, b before coming to Estro. Uh, I of course you can never imagine where you're gonna where you're gonna find, but I, I imagined something very different from what I found, which okay. is like living. I felt I felt like number one. I was like in someone's living room. Yes, because it was it was like a very cozy cozy uh, atmosphere, a accentuated by all of the curves that Andre Fu uh, put in there. Uh, I mean, the guy knows what, what he's doing. Obviously, oh yeah, he's obviously, one of, obviously. He, 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 he's one of the big names. How is the process of working with an interior design star of, the, of, of, of that kind? How is the, is the, the um, creative process from, do you have a lot of, of, of uh, say in the briefing? Uh, how is the collaboration? Well, working with Andre Fu for me was beautiful. I mean, it's the first time that I really work uh, close to an interior designer, and I was lucky enough to work uh, with one of the best as well. Uh, so, I mean, we had a uh, initial discussing, uh, in initial uh, chat about uh, what the restaurant should it be, the concept, what I wanted to do, what I want to express with my food. Uh, I showed him, I show him a lot of reference of plates, uh, porcelain, cutlery, uh, and I showed him a lot of reference of my city, Naples. Uh, the color palette of the city, uh, the structure of the buildings, uh, the arcade. Uh, so his idea was taken, uh, he, he took this idea of uh, an Italian villa of the south with this gate, you know, you have mm -hmm. a gate that comes in and uh, we need to adapt also to the space we had. Uh, so you see my, my space, for instance, a low ceiling, right? Yes. Uh, so I hated to have a, uh, a carpet on the a, on a dining room. 
Hmm. But for Istanbul, it was the only solution to have a space which with that height of ceiling that doesn't make too, no- too much noise when people walk in it. So this was a technical thing that he, he taught me because I didn't want to have that. But regarding the curves, the terracotta, the green, the Mediterranean, the sea, they are all things that uh, I wish he would have put in his, uh, his design. So I, t- I show him a lot of pictures, a lot of reference, and then he come out with this idea of this living room, as you said. So mm. the idea that you got when you went in is exactly that, that you open a gate of an Italian uh, villa in uh, the Amalfi Coast probably, and then you get into this beautiful salotto, which my idea was a little bit of the uh, salotto letterario, which is something, you know, I hmm. mean, in Napoli we had a, uh, we, we had a lot of this old, bi- we still have a lot of these old buildings in, 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 in the city. Uh, and in Napoli, you know, the, the funny things that is different from other city and uh, the part of the world, that back then in the days, uh, poor people and rich people live on the same building, hmm. just a different floor. So and so you could see that that, that you know that in the other city you know the, the poor people live outside of the city and maybe the the rich people go inside of the city, but in Napoli back then the poor people live, live at ground ground level while the rich people give, lives in the same building but on the higher floors with these beautiful living rooms where, you know, hmm. uh, with the archive, with, the, with, with this color. So I want to have this kind of feeling, but in a modern way, of course. I didn't want to have a, a restaurant which is Baroque, uh, but I want to have the kind of feeling. And he, I have to say, his interpretation was amazing because uh, when I saw the first draw, I, I love, was love at first sight. Uh, and of course, you can see in his design, there's a big Asian touch. So. The most interesting thing of uh, Astro, I think, is that there is a vision of an Italian architecture, mood, uh, curves, design, seen by uh, an Asian designer, so which is eyes. So how do uh, Asian design sees my city, my age? So w- for me, it was something extremely special. So, uh, and he made uh, a fantastic restaurant, I think. It's, uh, it's really like the restaurant I wanted to have. So, yes, uh, it, 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 everything fits. And more often than not, I mean, I, I, I don't go to Michelin stars every day, but I spend a lot of my life in restaurants being a yeah. commercial. You go to, uh, to a lot of places and you, th- and you think there is something off in this place that doesn't, that doesn't mix. And believe me, eh, I, I'm not saying all of this because I just want to make you feel good. Uh, no, probably no. if I didn't think them, I, didn't, I wouldn't say the contrary. I'm just yeah. saying because everything was was uh, right in place um it's it's, it's 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 super nice talking to someone that just created a baby like this because uh, it really um, every every angle is taken care of and for, for someone of such like me this is something super super nice you put a lot of energy into the project of estro um but you do also many other things you do collaborations consulting with other restaurants um how is uh, how creatively, operationally is putting in place all of these other collaborations? Because I see f- from your Instagram that you go to Shenzhen very often. Uh, yes, I have a consultancy project in Shenzhen for a casual restaurant. Uh, this was also something new for me. Uh, I did consult consultancy before, but for shorter time period and for, uh, or maybe the taking part in only one menu. But the restaurant in Shenzhen was uh, actually I would say another small baby of mine because I, I follow the process since the very beginning. So me, I mean, the owners knows me for Astro and then they like what I was doing. They asked me to create a whole concept for them in Shenzhen. We can uh, say the name, by the way. Yes, Terra Madre. Terra, Terra Madre. Terra Madre. It's called Terra Madre. It's a casual, very casual Italian restaurant, uh, super affordable in uh, Kerry Plaza. Uh, and this... Uh, is a concept that we create together, but with all my inputs. So from the menu to the, I mean, I work with uh, Sean Dix for the design for this project. So Sean did a great job uh, creating uh, something over there because it's a bit of challenging space, Uh, but all the branding, uh, the visuals, the mood of the place, the menu, everything was uh, actually created by, with my consultancy. Uh, I'm still consulting for this place uh, now after one year I open uh, and it's a, a very different kind of job uh, compared to what I'm doing right now. Uh, 
uh, because I'm not there on the in my restaurant I'm on the fields every day every day yeah, every day you never leave in my restaurant besides when I go for holidays I'm always there uh, lunch and dinner while in Shenzhen I'm not there I go there once a month for a couple of days Sunday Monday usually when I'm close uh, mm. or few days more when I have some events and so on uh, so it's a very different way of uh, doing my job because you need to delegate 100% in my restaurant of course I have delegation but until a certain uh, point uh, for Shenzhen was creating a team I had three people work with me in Macau three chefs working with me in Macau before uh, who took over who, from the beginning uh, now we have a bit of change of team but uh, I'm confident it's going to be the same and it was also I mean again Shenzhen is also challenging for western restaurant you know uh, again to are you very Italian yes we are uh, yeah you very Italian uh, in the way we do uh, and I wanted to be I mean and, and the mission I had from the owners was I want you to propose something which is very Italian I don't want to compromise yes uh, in the end we had to compromise a little bit but we still have a strong soul of uh, uh, Italian real Italian over there you know I mean again no stereotypes fuck the stereotypes and uh, and when uh, when you leave the kitchen or you go on holiday uh, how how do you i mean i i think i i i can anticipate what you're going to reply because you already said before but how do you ensure that things uh, run smoothly in the kitchen and can you sleep how, how present are you you know with talking to people talking to to a uh, sous chef to the gm or do you just let them be and let them let's say get the reins of the place when i'm not there i 100 percent let them be okay uh they need to contact me only if there is a problem that they cannot solve but it is duty of my managers to solve problems. That's why the manager, otherwise I will have only junior staff. I mean, I think a good manager is someone who can solve the problem before he arrives even to me that I'm your boss. So yes. if I hire you to be a manager, you need to be able to solve 99% of the problems before arrives to me. 1% you cannot solve, you come to me. That's the duty of a manager. So when I'm not there, I'm 100% rely on my my team to uh, to to run the operation. Run the operation. And I'm pretty sure, you know, from the comments of people have been there when I'm not there and so on that you go to Astro when I'm not there is the same kind of experience you have if I'm there. The only difference is that maybe I'm not going to say hi to you. So, you know, that's mm -hmm. what you're missing. Perception from a customer point of view maybe it's different. Oh, the chef is not there, it was not great today. But I'm 100% sure that my team execute exactly what we do together, even when I'm not present over there. I, th I think, I mean, that's probably one of the most difficult things. I, and and that's one of the biggest signs of success. When you create a machine of course. that interprets your creativity, but runs, runs on its own with people that are accountable. So, of course. Um, I mean, I've been to uh, a lot of the Massimo Bottura outlet yeah. uh, because, you know, Catherine is from Modena. So yeah. And he was never there. Like, for example, the new Cavallino in Maranello, which used to be a not so good restaurant yeah. since his team took, o took over, is fantastic. Okay. But the times I've been there, is he's not there and of the course. food is still, fa is still yeah. fantastic. Yeah. No, no, super, super, super. Um, I want to ask you just be be before, before we wrap up, I want to ask you about uh, social media and being present in, uh, and being, um, how to say, uh, needing to promote yourself, I think, uh, on a daily basis. How are you living with that? Is this something that you like, you do casually, you do you do yourself, you have someone do it for you? Okay, regarding my, I mean, the only active page I have is on uh, uh, Instagram, so I don't really, I'm not really present on uh, other social media platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook is abandoned. Uh, so the only thing is IG and all the following and the people's follow me is uh, all uh, uh, natural followers uh, despite the fact that uh, nowadays uh, people are happy to buy their their followers uh, mine was pretty much so de depending on what i was doing i don't have anyone following my page uh, i had it for a short period of time a uh, couple of years ago but i didn't like uh, how they handle it so I decided to do everything by my own. I'm not super active on it. Uh, I have a peer company working with us for the restaurant, but just for the restaurant, so mm -hmm. for for Estro, but not for me personally. Uh, 
and they are very useful uh, you need i think in 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 hong kong in such a competitive market you need a peer company helping to connect with the right people and to push you in the right direction uh, otherwise for you independently it's very difficult there's very few there are but there's very few examples in hong kong uh, we don't have a strong peer behind that uh, uh, managed to be in the right place at the right time so this peer company is helping us to uh, keep in contact with the right people you know hmm. uh, around the guides around the awards uh, the newspaper the journalists you know keep ourselves uh, in the momentum and uh, keep ourselves alive in the eyes of this uh, media conglomerate it is important there is there is a i mentioned before barleone yes. which is an amazing uh, amazing place mortadella yeah. uh, uh, sliced uh, in the moment and so on but especially in the location, yeah. I, I, I have always thought if it wasn't because of a very good coordinated PR campaign, that place that is good would have been a little bit maybe, yeah, I, of course. I don't want to say forgotten, but because but, life sometimes but, is unfair. You know, but he did a super good job, I but, think. But uh, Lorenzo, he is himself a marketing machine. You know, The way he connects with people, the way he tells stories. He's a marketing machine himself. He's much, much better than I am on doing that personally, you know. And Lorenzo is very strong because PR of himself is he PR. Did it. He yes. is PR of himself. He has a PR company for Barleone, but I can tell you straightforward that he is the real PR of himself. And people love him for that. Loves him for his story, loves him for his stupid creative things that uh, in the end are so bad. They're so successful. People get so hooked up for it. Yes. The guy is super smart. Lorenz is a super smart guy. And on the other hand, you don't need only that. You need to be also talented, right? So hmm. he's talented at what he does. I mean, he decided to do a bar without bullshit, you know, without uh, homemade ingredients, all these kind of things they used to do before. Uh, he stopped to do it to do a very straightforward concept serving like just classics and a little bit twist on the classic, but well done with good ingredients, with a good atmosphere, with good food to accompany, with a very interesting design, you know, which is not crazy inspiring, but in the end it's cool, you know, I mean. It's super, it's yeah. Insane. So you feel, you feel it in, in a real neighborhood bar, that's what he wanted. Yes. I, 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 I Particularly appreciated it because um, I am a little bit of a hater. Let's say uh, a disclaimer. So <laughs> disclaimer. Uh, so sometimes I, I when I go to restaurants, I the, f the main thing that I'm looking for is good food. Yeah. And sometimes and I and I speak to friends in F and B in management positions, and they said we develop restaurant concepts first based on the experience. Sometimes Correct. probably not in fine dining, but no, no, uh, no, even in fine dining sometimes. And and I always say I say to Katerina a lot of time and to my friends close friends I, I just want a restaurant with quite white cloth and just you know simple food that you know I, I feel comfortable. I don't with. want I the experience. I, I want the, the but you know. And Barleone a little bit is like this. Yes, it is, but it does in a good way, not in a bad way. No, 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 in a perfect yeah, way. In yeah, a, perfect, in a way. perfect way. I mean, there's example of restaurant that are super successful in Hong Kong. I would not mention because I don't want. Uh, because I'm also a little bit of a hater in my, in my <laughs> no, no, no joke. I, I'm a hater of people serving bad food and having success. I have to, to be honest. I hate to see people serving bad food and being successful because it makes me angry. You know, I mean, hmm. it, it's not about having success. It's about having success and serving bad food. This one makes me really pissed. And there are few examples in Hong Kong, to be honest, yes. of restaurant <laughs> that they are experiential let's put it this way but they save you shitty food a very expensive price and you don't understand why they're working but they are and they're super popular super bbc why instagram Be no i don't think it's only about it i think because people i mean wants to h hang out in this place because they're fun you know hmm. they're funny you know you have there you have your with your friends uh, maybe the service is good, the atmosphere is good, uh, and then, you know, the food is not that great, uh, whatever, you know. So, because not everyone cares about food like you and I, hmm. you know. So, this is also a point, you know. If the food is decent, it's okay. I mean, I met, I, I spend my night with my friends and having fun, having drinks and whatever. So, if the food is fine, oh, it's okay. So, 
So maybe we are content because of we are demanding with the food. Probably we, yes. We would live easier without, yeah. without that. Probably yes. Probably yes. So if it, what, what, what would you do? Let's say, how would you create a restaurant if you said, okay, there is no interior design. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a white wall, white cloth, nothing. Not even not even uh, pictures hanging on the walls. Yeah. What what type of menu would you put in a in a place like this? It's a difficult question, but you know we get so to the end, so they, are, they get more difficult. Okay. So it's a it's a it's a white restaurant with white clothes and nothing else nothing else just the food and you can choose any type of food let's say you can you can go from uh i don't know uh arrosini uh, to uh to a minestrone to tortellini what do you choose probably in a place like this i would serve super super uh, traditional homey uh i mean Let's you think of a, a of a minimalistic room, and but your food is baroque, so it's a super contrast with the super minimalism of your dining room. So you say you mentioned tortellini. Huh? Imagine you go with a, a super nice. Uh, imagine all white, super minimal, nothing. But you go with this super soup bowl with like all the gold and uh, so you break that minimalist you have around hmm. with your table. The, the tableware and the food in it that is completely the opposite of what you have surrounded. No, it makes sense. Maybe maybe Genovese. Yeah, maybe a Genovese. You know, you know? Genovese. You know all the, the do you still have it? Yeah, yeah. In the restaurant? No, I don't have it. Uh, now I have a version, another version of it. Basically, uh, my buttons I do now. Yes. I have a liquid Genovese inside. Ah. So this is the. You, you know that um, a new dish that we just launched two days ago. I, uh, I think I think we need to go and visit Filippo. Yeah, we we, we, we make we, we make we make it. No, I wanted to ask <laughs> you because you know I feel a little bit um, when 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 you want to humiliate yourself, yeah, you need to try to let's say uh, try to tell a chef you need to come and taste my Genovese. No, but, but I will invite you because Filippo said it was good. Well. <laughs> no, but you know, it's I mean, everyone's oh, you know, chef, chefs in the end like to eat simple. You know, I mean, I like to eat simple. Uh, I like to go to fine places, high hands places, once in a while, but mostly I like to eat very simple, you know, very straightforward. No, I have a Geno but so Genovese, you eat at home or you never do at home? Never do at home. That's super good. Cool. I, I made it twice. There's a, lo there a lot of things I don't do at home uh, because I feel it's not worth it to do at home, you know. Is it because the house gets very smelly? No, it's because it's not about the smell, it's about. I know that if I do certain things at home, will never be as good as I do in the restaurant, so I don't do it at all. You don't try. My yeah. mother says when she cooks the Genovese and she goes out, people recognize that she was cooking. Because <laughs> 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 made the onion of it. <laughs> A little bit. Uh, I will invite you to eat the Genovese. Die, I, die, did die. It, I did it twice because uh, I never knew about the existence. Okay. Anna Palmer invited me once to eat it. Okay. And I said, I, I, I love onions. Tonight I go to Anna Varma for dinner. Let's ask her if, uh, uh, if she does Genovese. Ask her if she does Genovese. Um, no, uh, uh, we, when, uh, I don't know if in this house or the next one, but uh, if, if I can find... Anna, uh, Fernando ha detto stasera che fai la Genovese. <laughs> live, live. Live, live. No, no, this is super, super good. Um, Antimo. Yeah. Uh, I am very happy because I, I had written some questions. You answered some of them before I asked them. Okay. So it's super good. But there, are, there were some of them that we didn't get to, to ask. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thank you for coming. No, thank you. Thank uh, you. That I was fine. I that feel like fun. we are elevated after today. <laughs> uh, and I feel like we have a duty to actually go eat the new menu. I see. Uh, because it has to be very different from the one I ate It's very ago. different. I think there is not a single dish uh, that remains since one you had. So the question is, when when can we find a place? No, Antimo. you can, you can. I can. can All right, can. right. Just we, write we'll, me. We'll, we'll, uh, you write me. You write me, and I, and I book you. In, no problem. I have a, I have four weeks of travel now for okay. work. I'm when you're back? When you're back? Uh, when you're back. Uh, late November. I, I'll I late take November. Some, before late I go November. to Italy Fantastic. on the holidays. Done. Uh, thank you. Uh, Grazie. I think the, the show was not mine. The show was yours. No, uh, no. So thank you for, for coming. Me. Uh, you get a gift. You get a lamp Grande. from this living by Lourdes. Beautiful. And you get also the last words to close the show. So this is your camera. So you go. That's there. my camera. That's your camera. Tell tell whoever you want to uh, you want to tell what you're doing, what you're up to, uh, what's going on in your life, or just close the show, say ciao, ciao. 
Guys, break the stereotypes of Italian cuisine. Bravi, 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 bravi. Thank you everyone, the last meeting of the week. Uh, by the way, I forget about the sponsors. I have a sponsor. Uh, ah. super, ni super nice guy, Argentinian Neil Johnson. Okay. Um, his company is the Wine Not, eh? so that's winenot.com.hk, and he gives people that listen to the podcast five percent discount uh, upon checkout. Ah, beautiful. For, so for wine and spirits and everything. What about a bottle of wine for me? No, it's not included. No, I give uh, it to you. I give it to you. Uh, okay, it to okay, you. okay, okay, okay. But when you come home to drink the to eat the Genovese. Fair enough. Fair enough. Ciao, guys. Thank Ciao, you. Thank have you, a nice. You're gonna listen to this you. on a Friday. So have a happy weekend. We're gonna have a happy week. I'm going to Tokyo tomorrow uh, to hang out with the uh, Yoit Studio um, and uh, other friends. All the best. Thank you. Grazie. Ciao, ciao. Oh, abbiamo parlato.